Hello there. This video is a video about my life <laughs> because it just occurs to me that this channel has taken on a lot of subscribers and um, not everyone wants to hear about my life, of course, but it might be that if you're a new subscriber, you might be interested in knowing a little bit what my story is from my Jehovah's Witness experience. And yeah, I thought I'd just try and summarize it as best I can. And it all really begins with my parents. My father was raised as a Jehovah's Witness, mostly, I think, by his mother. I think his mother took it far more seriously than his father did. And his mother converted to Jehovah's Witnesses after receiving a knock on the door in 1953, not long after her parents, both of her parents had died. So you can imagine how appealing it would be to have witnesses on your doorstep saying, oh, well, you get to see them again in this paradise. So she raised my dad to be a Jehovah's Witness and my, my dad has always and continues to take the religion extremely seriously. With my mother, it was slightly different. Her parents weren't Jehovah's Witnesses, but she had quite a tragic life with quite a lot of heartache. And I, to, to cut a long story short, I think that um, the Jehovah's Witness theology was very appealing to her at a certain point in her life particularly after she'd uh, lost her husband under tragic circumstances. And it was just very appealing, I think, for a religion to come along and say, well, you get to live in this blissful paradise where you have everything you need and there'll be no more death or pain or, or misery. So those are the parents that I had growing up. And I don't think I can complain too much about my childhood. My parents were fairly easygoing, even if they were very committed believers. I tell a story in my book about the Armageddon drill, which many of you will be familiar with, of when my father in a family worship evening um, took a phone call. He made the phone ring and picked it up and pretended to be speaking to an elder in the congregation and we were supposed to overhear the conversation and uh, he pretended that the great tribulation had started and that we all needed to pack our bags and get in the car and flee to the woods and I took this seriously and in a moment of terror I ran upstairs and started packing my things. I really believed Armageddon was coming only to come back downstairs and realise it was all a joke. I think that story sums up the seriousness with which my parents took Jehovah's Witness theology and the lengths they were willing to go to to make sure that we embraced it, that is me and my sister, that we took it seriously too. And again, I try to be as fair as possible in recognising that my mum and dad were doing what they thought was for my benefit. They genuinely believed the religion and they believed that if we were all to survive Armageddon as a family, then I needed to believe it and my sister needed to believe it. So they did their best with, with the kind of cards they were dealt. But of course it was all a lie as I was to find out much later on in my life. So you have this scenario where I've been raised to take the religion extremely seriously. I'm very careful with who I, who my friends are. I don't, I'm a good Jehovah's Witness kid. I don't go to wild parties. Um, I don't drink. I certainly don't do drugs or smoke cigarettes. I'm like the textbook Jehovah's Witness child. I got baptized at the age of 11. And if there was uh, maintenance going on at the Kingdom Hall. I was there. I was always trying to be available for the congregation in whatever capacity. My parents actually let me go to college for two years after I left high school. And that was quite, that's quite rare for Jehovah's Witnesses because um, the Jehovah's Witness religion looks down on higher education. But my parents, I think, 
felt that I needed to have some kind of um, basis for providing for my family in the future. And so they allowed me to go to college for two years with the understanding that I would be using my qualification to get a good job that would enable me to pioneer. And so I went to college for two years, but while I was in college, I was spending more and more time with other Jehovah's Witnesses who were my age, who were pioneers, so that by the time the two years in college were ending, I was already chomping at the bit to get involved in pioneering and to just leave behind any aspirations of uh, of learning more. And I had people at my college, like teachers, telling me, oh, well, you should, after you finish this course, you should do this course and you should do this course. And um, I just ignored them and said, no, I'm quitting. I'm, uh, I'm going to do this pioneering, which I did. And it was announced, I think, more or less the same, it might have even been at the same meeting that I was, it was announced that I was a regular pioneer and I'd been appointed um, a ministerial servant. And that was when I just turned 19, they appointed me a ministerial servant. And, and But the congregation that I was in was quite crowded with elders. So that as I got into my 20s, I was starting to feel irritated at not having many opportunities because all of the jobs were taken, basically, and I didn't really feel very needed. But around the time that I was sort of 19, um, I started to question my beliefs. And what happened was I went to the 1999 uh, God's Prophetic Word Convention and a book was released that I was very excited about, and I have it on my shelves. It is the Daniel's Prophecy book. And I was thrilled at the release of this because I felt as though I'd kind of missed out a bit on the excitement of the Revelation Climax book, which was released when I was a kid. And I didn't really take that book seriously anyway. I thought, well, here's a prophecy book for my generation that I can read and I can get to learn and understand properly. And then I'll be able to kind of get involved in conversations at the Kingdom Hall and that kind of thing. So I took it home and I absolutely devoured it. But as I was getting to the end, something really weird happened and I started to question some of the things that were said. And some of the interpretations of prophecy just didn't make sense to me. For example, in one prophecy, I think it's the King of the North prophecy, Rome becomes Nazi Germany. And in another prophecy elsewhere in the book, Rome becomes Anglo-America. And I think in other books as well, there'd been, it, it was explained that Rome had become Anglo-America. And I was thinking, well, why would the Bible give two opposing narratives of Rome becoming Anglo-America and Rome becoming the arch-rival of Anglo-America in another uh, prophecy. So that's just an example of what was confusing me. And it was really quite strange for me to come to this conclusion that I, I disagreed <laughs> with the governing body on something. That was really difficult for me to get my head around. And I struggled to, to deal with it, if I'm honest. But then, when I was 21, and my mother died of cancer. And, of course, when you lose someone like that, especially someone like a parent, and if you're in a religion that's telling you, well, the way for you to see your mother again is to be the best Jehovah's Witness you can be, is to cling as closely as possible to the organization because she's not quite dead. She's still alive in Jehovah's memory and you get to see her again someday if you, you know, follow the faithful slave. So all of these doubts I was having got put on the back burner and I just threw myself into, um, into the religion. So much so that 
this issue that I was having with there being too many elders. I think there were 18 elders at one point. And I just, I was, I became convinced that I needed to spread my wings and, and move to a different congregation where there was a need. And I asked my circuit overseer. And when I was 24, he assigned me to a neighboring congregation where I think at the time there were only three elders um, so that I could um, help out there. And then the year after that, I got accepted for ministerial training school. And that was a whole whole other experience. It felt like I'd reached this, this Everest of mine because I've been wanting to go to ministerial training school for a long time. What I most enjoyed about ministerial training school was the camaraderie with the between the students. Most of us got on really, really well. And we kind of had each other's back and it that just that element alone I found very faith strengthening even if the instruction that we were receiving wasn't anything extraordinary we were mostly being taught out of the very publications that most witnesses have access to so there wasn't really anything any like massive religious enlightenment that I was receiving even though I probably told myself that it was a big deal. It was really more the camaraderie. And because we'd grown so close, we decided that we would um, go on a reunion a year, the next year. So 2006, we would go for our first reunion. And one of the students in our class was from Croatia. So we decided, well, why don't we head across Europe to Croatia and uh, and go there for the reunion, which we did. And that's where I ended up meeting my now wife. Um, we started, I guess you could say, a friendship, and we started talking together online on MSN Messenger. That's how far back it was. And we ended up deciding that we were serious about each other. But the obvious problem we had was that I was in the UK, as an MTS student who'd been assigned by Watchtower to a congregation. I'd been reassigned to the congregation that I'd originally been assigned to that only, that only had a small number of elders. And what we decided to do was that Diana would come to the UK and work as an au pair so that we could, um, we could court each other. And that's what she did. And pretty soon after that, I think we'd only been courting for like six months when I proposed and um, we ended up getting married on the Croatian coast. We had our honeymoon in Europe, but for the first two years after we got married, I was, we were living in the UK and in 2008, I was asked to be an elder in my congregation. So that felt very much like, because I'd wanted to be an elder for a long time, I guess partly because I wanted to live up to the expectations of my family. It was the thing to do, I guess. But I also genuinely felt that I had something to offer and that I could maybe help people in the congregation by... Um, by just trying to show love to them and, and by... I, I was really keen on giving talks as well and trying to make my talks as lively and entertaining as possible. So it was a big thing for, for them to make me an elder. But then, a year after they appointed me, um, basically, my marriage was on the rocks. And it was because I had been contacting women online. I'd basically developed this kind of learned behavior from when I was single because Jehovah's Witnesses have to deal with a lot of sexual repression. They are told that they're not allowed to masturbate. They're told that they're only allowed to date other witnesses. They're told that they're not allowed to have sex before marriage. And that greatly affects someone. I think, I think it affects people profoundly, emotionally. And my coping mechanism was um, chatting with girls online, on chat rooms and that kind of thing. That was how I 
coped and that behaviour kind of seeped into my marriage as well. And uh, Diana discovered it one morning and then we were at this crossroads where it was, well, what do we do now? Clearly I can't be an elder anymore. Um, actually, I, I remember having a conversation where I said, well, we could try and work this out between us and just carry on as, as far as everyone else is concerned, carry on as though it hasn't happened. And, uh, and that will enable me to kind of sustain my faith. But, uh, and the other thing that we could do is come clean and go to the elders, but that will take us down another path, which I fear could take me away from the faith. I remember having that conversation. I, I, I described it to Diana as two different train tracks going in different directions. And um, But what we ended up doing was I ended up coming clean. I wrote a letter. We, well, we moved congregations. We moved back to my original congregation for reasons I go into in my book. And I wrote a letter and posted it through the coordinator's uh, house. Uh, he, he was a, a good friend of the family and I confessed to everything in the letter and stood down as, a, as an elder, handed in my, um, my elder's guidebook and we had a judicial committee. I remember it being a very emotional experience. I remember crying a lot. I remember being asked lots of probing inappropriate questions about uh, what I'd been doing, um, about masturbating and that kind of thing. So it was, I look back now and I, I kind of feel very disappointed in myself, isn't the word, because I know why I did it, but I just, um, at that time I was convinced that these men had authority over me, even though I realise now that they were just there were just some guys. I might as well have been speaking to, I say in my book, I might as well have been telling my story to the local postman or the local shopkeeper. So anyway, we we have these, this judicial committee and the, I end up being reproved, not disfellowshipped. So it was announced that I was reproved and I was put on restrictions. Um, and we started to have... Uh, I started to have fairly regular shepherding visits to see how I was doing after, after my reproof. And I remember it coming up in one of those shepherding visits that one of the issues I was facing was that I'd kind of come to the conclusion that I'd never really 100% taken my beliefs seriously which could have contributed to my behaviour because I had these doubts that I'd been suppressing from when I, from back when I was 19, from when the Daniel book came out. And I went through some of those doubts and, and described the gist of them. And I think I remember saying something like, um, surely it can't be that uh, bowls of wrath and trumpet blasts and burning mountains falling into the sea in the book of Revelation are all to do with conventions and kingdom news campaigns from early witness history. Surely, surely that's not what <laughs> the Bible writers had in mind when they were writing those things. And I remember my coordinator saying, I remember first of all there being shock but I also remember my coordinator saying, well, Lloyd, you have to remember that what happened when the, when the, witnesses, when the, when the witness religion began, that was a momentous thing. And of course, the Bible writers <clears throat> would have been talking about that because it was a really big deal. And that was the kind of best explanation they could come up with. But they never really addressed my doubts and we never really talked about that again. They just kind of left that. Probably they regret now <laughs> um, not pursuing that further. They just kind of, okay, well, let's move on to something else. And anyway, Diana and I decided that we would move back. 
we, she would move back to Croatia and I would come with her and we would basically try and start afresh in Croatia. And I managed to convince myself that that was something that would be really positive for my faith because it would be like a blank canvas. I could start from zero and just try and um, slowly, you know, work work on getting my privileges back. Basically, that's what I wanted to do. And I remember my best friend at the time saying, oh, don't do it, Lloyd, don't do it. Because he'd been in foreign language groups and he knew that when you're attending meetings without understanding what's being said, because you're in the process of learning the language, it's it can be difficult to gain benefit from the meeting and it can be actually damaging to you spiritually. And I kind of brushed this aside and I said, no, 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 um, I've, I'm on top of this. Um, my relationship with Jehovah is too important for me to let anything dampen my zeal and I'm determined to learn Croatian and it won't be long until I'm speaking the language and getting the full benefit from the meetings. So anyway, we moved to Croatia and exactly what was predicted to happen, happened. And within a few months, just purely through the process of going to the meeting and not understanding a word and thinking, hang on, what do I believe? You know, I, I understand now that I've been attending these meetings my whole life and I can see them all kind of yabbering away enthusiastically to each other. But what do I really believe? And then all of these doubts started flooding back from when I was 19. And it actually got to the point where I think I think it was a Sunday. I said I was too ill to the ghost of the meeting and I stayed behind. And I actually, I thought I'm going to write down a list of everything I don't agree with and all of the grievances that I had. And it ended up being nine grievances. I called it my nine grievances. Um, and some of them weren't big, big things. It was mostly to do with uh, theological inconsistencies. But once I'd actually written them down, it was like, well, I know I'm no longer a Jehovah's Witness. Because if I were a Jehovah's Witness, I would, be, I would be fine with all of these issues. But the very fact that I've committed pen to paper and, and written a list of this proves that I no longer believe I'm not a Jehovah's Witness anymore. So then followed quite an emotional process of, of explaining things to Diana. And Diana was very, she was shocked because she was still a believing JW, but she was as supportive as she possibly could be. And we concluded that I needed to go inactive. So I wrote a letter to my elders explaining that um, I just couldn't go on, go on preaching anymore and I couldn't come to the meetings anymore because I was having serious doubts. And actually, when I look back on that letter, it could very easily have been interpreted by a different group of elders as a letter of disassociation because I was so adamant in what I was saying about basically no longer believing. But the elders came round. I, I had, I think, two or three elders came round and to talk about it. And I remember us all crying at one point. It was a very emotional meeting. And I basically managed to convince them that, look, I'm still going to be coming to memorials and I'm still going to be on friendly terms with everyone. It's just that I'm not going to be at the meetings anymore. And I think that satisfied them, or at least for a while it satisfied them. What later happened was a new elder moved into our congregation from Bethel and he had a far more kind of by-the-book approach to undertaking his duties and he'd concluded that it couldn't possibly be a conscientious reason why I was no longer attending meetings. It had to be that I was concealing something. It had to be that I was keeping some sin private. So this guy actually dragged my wife to one side at one of the meetings and said, 
Um, I know that Lloyd treats you like a cloth for cleaning the floor. So you need to tell us what he's doing that's wrong, uh, basically. And Diana was just totally shocked that some guy who didn't even know me, we literally didn't know each other, and he'd reached this conclusion that I was treating her badly, which just wasn't true. And so she came right back home and told me all this. And what I was able to do was say, well, okay, what he did there was a flagrant breach of protocol. You do not gather information in that way by dragging someone's wife to one side and interrogating them outside of the presence of um, th that person's husband. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, let the elders know that from now on I refuse to meet with them until they apologize for what they've done because what they've done is manifestly wrong. Once they've apologized then I'll meet with them knowing full well that they would never, elders never apologize folks, they just don't. So I knew I was safe then um, and then there was this kind of period where I wasn't bothered and I could just do my research and I started um, interacting online with other ex-witnesses and I chose the name John Cedars. And the reason for that was, I've talked about it in another video, basically I'd, I'd contacted Paul Grundy at JW Facts with some information on the Cedar Point Ohio Assembly and how it had been um, represented in a disingenuous way in the history DVD, Faith in Action, because they'd done a computer-generated version of this historical event that didn't include any American flags. But if you look at the original black and white photos, there are American flags everywhere. And I passed this information on to Paul Grundy and said, maybe you'll find this helpful. And he said, well, what I'll do is I'll post it on this forum and see what people think. And when he posted it on the forum and I saw people talking about it, I was like, I've got to get involved in this conversation. Um, so because we were talking about the Cedar Point, Ohio convention, I chose the name Cedars. And as part of the setup, I had to set up an email account which required a first name as well as a second name. And I just chose the name John, John Cedars. Um, and that's where the channel name comes from because for a number of years, I was writing under this pseudonym rather than my real name. And as a last kind of tribute to that journey that I've been on, I've kept it as the name of this channel. But then by November 2013, we'd reached another crossroads because Diana was pregnant. We'd reached the conclusion that we just couldn't... Oh, by that point, she'd more or less woken up. She was maybe a year behind me in waking up. And that was just purely through me being patient with her and not trying to bombard her with information, just letting her come to me with questions. And if I found something that was genuinely interesting, I would share it, but she could see that it was just purely my excitement and not me trying to manipulate her in any way. So that by November 2013, we both decided we've got to get out. We've got to make a clean break because there's no way in the world we can allow even the possibility that our daughter will get roped into this organization. Let's say we stay inactive and we just stay below the radar. Our relatives, our believing JW relatives are going to assume it's their duty to preach to our child and do the job that we're no longer doing. So we need to make a stand. We need to disassociate. And I knew that just by making videos, so I made my first vlog on November 8th, 2013. I knew that just by doing that and just by posting an article where I gave my picture and I told my story, I knew they'd come for me. And they did. And we had this apostasy trial, which was just bizarre. And that was it. There was a clean break. And the rest, as they say, is history. But that's pretty much my the story of 
my time as a Jehovah's Witness. What's interesting is that when I look back on it all now, I don't really have, I can't imagine it going any differently, my life story. And that's strange because I think most people who are raised as Jehovah's Witnesses and who wake up and realize that it was, they were being lied to, I think if you offer them the opportunity to go back in time and plead with their past selves and, you know, wake them up, I think most people would take that opportunity and, and do their best to change the course of their lives in some way so that they at least weren't spending as many years or decades in this harmful, abusive group. And I've, one of the questions I've grappled with is this question of, would I go back if I could? Would I change anything? Would I try and shake myself out of it? And while I can fully sympathize with the majority of ex-witnesses, um, again, taking that opportunity if they could, I personally wouldn't because I think that the experience that I went through, even though I've suffered as a result of having that experience because my father is not speaking to me, is shunning me, is shunning Diana, is even shunning my daughter Jessica. He hasn't met Jessica yet and Jessica's four years old and that produces a lot of anger in me and it's very, very, I feel a, a strong sense of injustice which I think fuels a lot of my activism. Um, but even though it's had a detrimental effect being in the religion, I don't think I would change anything because going through that experience has given me the insight and the experience and the knowledge to maybe make a difference, to through this channel potentially help others who have had a far worse experience perhaps than I've had in the religion and to give them the tools and the information and the resources that they need to um, basically get rid of the guilt. I think for many who were raised as witnesses, the guilt is one of the biggest obstacles to happiness, this fear that you're going to be dis destroyed at Armageddon any moment unless you return to Jehovah's organization. One of the biggest kicks I get out of doing the job I do and making the videos I make is when I hear from people who perhaps they've been disfellowshipped for years or decades, but they're finally able to get rid of that guilt and lead a happy, fulfilled life without any morbid fear that they will be destroyed at any moment. But I digress, the purpose of this video was to tell you guys my story. Again, for anyone who is new to the channel, I thought it would be helpful to just give you an overview of how I got to where I am. If you want to read about it in more detail, this is my book, The Reluctant Apostate. Uh, it's rather thick. Uh, some of it, not all of it is my story. A lot of it is just a commentary on the Jehovah's Witness religion. But if you're really interested in going into my story in more detail, that's where you can find it. I hope you have found this video interesting. Please don't forget to subscribe for more videos. And as always, thank you for watching.